I am fascinated by swallowing. Dirty jokes aside, it's really quite amazing how we can perform such a complex task with such little thought. To move a piece of watermelon the 15 centimeters or so from our lips to our esophagus, we need to precisely coordinate the contraction of 31 pairs of muscles with sensory and motor information traveling along six of the 12 cranial nerves. After biting, manipulating, and chewing, we propel the watermelon to the back of the mouth using the tongue. We close off the nasal cavity. Don't want any watermelon juice getting up the nose. We valve off the opening to the airway, release the sphincter at the top of the esophagus, and drive the watermelon down the throat using the squeeze from the back of the tongue against the throat walls. And all of that happens in 800 milliseconds while we're trying to remember when the fireworks start. Swallowing is one of those critical life functions requiring urgent medical care if something goes wrong. It's one of the few motor acts that we need to be able to, be per be able to perform at birth on day one in order to survive, and we actually practice swallowing while in the womb. If at any point in our lifetime something goes wrong with our swallowing, the effects range further than just figuring out how to get nutrition and hydration. Imagine sitting at the Thanksgiving table, seeing the gorgeous spread, smelling the rich aromas, but not being able to enjoy your favorite dish or to participate in the debate about who makes a better pumpkin pie. Imagine not being able to take a cool drink of water into a parched throat or sip on that glorious first cup of coffee in the morning. So treating a swallowing disorder is more than just figuring out the safest way to provide nutrition and hydration for people. We want to be able to provide the comfort that comes along with eating and drinking and provide an individual the ability to participate in the many social events that center around food and drink. So what happens if something goes wrong with swallowing? People with swallowing complaints are often seen by a speech language pathologist such as myself. And the most common way that we take a look at the swallow is to do a video x-ray. So here we're looking at a, um, the side of the neck. We can see the mouth, jaw, and soft palate, the little dangly guy in the back of your throat, in the upper left, as well as the spine, esophagus, and airway in the middle of the screen. During this evaluation, the person will eat and drink food and liquid with a barium contrast in it, and that appears on the x-ray video as black. In a healthy person, we can see the material moving quickly through the mouth and throat. All of the material is going into the esophagus. The structures in the throat have good range of motion. None of that material is getting into the airway, and there's nothing left in the throat after the swallow. Isn't that cool? So this is a healthy swallower. What might someone look like with a severe swallowing disorder? Well, we can already see that this person has some black material in the throat left over from a previous swallow. And they're having difficulty moving this sip of liquid to the back of the mouth. This person needs multiple swallows to get that liquid down. Some of the liquid is getting into the airway, but despite efforts to cough it out. And there's quite a bit of residue left over in the throat after this swallow. So this is a gentleman in the late stages of Parkinson disease, which is a neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative disease, which is the second most common in the United States after Alzheimer's disease. Parkinson disease is characterized by a loss of brain cells in a region called the substantia nigra, and these brain cells produce dopamine, which is one of the main neurotransmitters required for movement control. Classic signs of Parkinson disease include a tremor at rest, small, slow, and stiff movements in the limbs, and a stooped posture with a shuffling walking pattern. However, as we just saw, swallowing disorders can happen in people with Parkinson's disease as well. And although swallowing disorders are a lot less visible than the classic signs, I mean, we need an x-ray to even see in there, they can pose a big problem for these patients. Food and liquid getting into the airway is a risk factor for what we call aspiration pneumonia, and that's the leading cause of death for people with Parkinson's disease. 
And currently there's no cure for Parkinson's disease, so our treatments are focused around decreasing the signs and symptoms. And unfortunately, the main medications and surgeries that improve motor function in the limbs in patients with Parkinson's disease do not meaningfully improve swallowing function. So these people are left to behavioral treatments such as exercise in order to improve their swallowing. So what can we do to improve a condition that could potentially shorten the lifespan of a person with Parkinson's disease? Well, let's look at a progression about how, how this might go for someone. Shortly after, after the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, typically some time passes before the person or their family members start to realize changes to swallowing. So this might be something like coughing after taking a sip of liquid. These changes progress to a problematic point, such as it would warrant a report to the primary care provider, who would then generate a referral to a speech-language pathologist, who would then perform a subjective swallowing evaluation, such as the x-ray videos that we saw. And from what was seen in those x-ray videos, a speech pathologist would recommend a treatment program that's reactive to the signs and symptoms. So something like, I notice this structure in the throat's not moving as much as it should, so I'm going to strengthen the muscles that are responsible for moving that structure. This reactive treatment paradigm can lead to variable outcomes for these patients, mostly because by the time it takes to get through this pipeline, the progression of the disease may have passed an ideal point for behavioral swallowing treatment. And a person may have difficulty returning to a desired level of function, say having a steak dinner and having a glass of wine. So then why don't speech language pathologists see people sooner in the progression of the disease of Parkinson's? Well, let's take a look at a swallowing video from someone in the early stages. So we can notice the liquid is moving quickly through the throat. Structures have good range of motion. No materials getting into the airway and there's no residue left over after the swallow. This is a beautiful swallow. But as a clinician, I have nothing to react to in this swallow. From what I see, there are no therapy, therapy um, items that, that would improve the swallow because it's already a good swallow. And that's a problem. In order to start a rehabilitation plan, as a therapist, I need to be able to document a change in function from a typical person. It might be that at this point in the progression of the disease, the muscles, nerves, and brain regions responsible for swallowing aren't yet affected. Or it could be that a swallowing evaluation such as this x-ray is not sensitive enough to detect very subtle deviations in motor control for swallowing. So you may have noticed these black rectangles in this person's throat. You haven't seen those on the other x-rays. These are high resolution pressure sensors. And we can now objectively measure swallowing pressures from all along the throat. And as I said before, when we swallow, food and liquid doesn't just magically glide down our throat. We have to actively contract muscle groups in the mouth and throat to push it down. And we can measure the pressures as a result of those muscle contractions at a fine scale and get a wealth of objective data about the swallow. Great. So then what do swallowing pressures look like in patients in the early stages of Parkinson's disease? Well, let's just narrow our focus to one region of the throat. So we'll look at the region where the back of the tongue presses up against the walls of the throat. And we can compare swallowing pressure waves from a healthy individual, as you'll see on the left, and someone in the early stages of Parkinson's disease on the right. And we can look at a single swallow, but we really start to see more interesting things if we look at multiple swallows from the same person. If we overlay multiple swallowing pressure waves at the same level in the throat over multiple swallows of the same amount of liquid, we can see an interesting phenomenon. Namely, the person with Parkinson's disease is generating a swallowing pressure pattern that is more variable than the healthy person. And we can objectively measure the degree to this variability. This within individual variability in a motor movement is not limited to swallowing in Parkinson's disease. It's also seen in other motor systems such as fine motor control in the hand and in the walking pattern. And this variability in swallowing motor control would not be able to be seen without an objective evaluation such as this swallowing pressure evaluation. 
So great, we have something to now objectively document a change in typical function in these patients in the early stages of swallowing disorders. And the patients that we've seen in the lab that I work in, this variability happens more or less throughout the throat and even in the absence of changes seen on an x-ray swallowing study. So it seems to better suit these patients to move from a reactive treatment model, waiting for signs and symptoms of a swallowing dysfunction to occur, and then trying to go in and rehabilitate a disordered swallow to a more proactive treatment model where someone is seen for, by a speech language pathologist soon after diagnosis, undergoes an objective swallowing evaluation, and then is put through a proactive treatment model where the goal is to preserve a high level of swallowing function for as long as possible. If we can prolong the amount of time that a person with Parkinson's disease is able to safely swallow, we can be able to prolong not only the lifespan of that person, but their quality of life. And this model of swallowing, or this model of proactive treatment is not limited to swallowing in Parkinson's disease. With improvements in diagnostics, health monitoring, and big data analysis, we have the potential to widen the scope of proactive treatments across many different dysfunctions in different chronic and degenerative diseases. If our goal is to preserve a good level of function, the person will be better equipped as their disease progresses or even as they age. And if we shift towards more objective evaluations in healthcare, we can not learn more, we can not only learn more about a disease process, but we can document evidence for treatment efficacy or non-efficacy, and we can get a clear understanding of rehabilitation in general. So clearly there's a lot of work left to be done here, and there are a lot of unanswered questions, but we move forward still because preserving a person's ability to eat and to drink is not a trivial matter. Thank you and cheers.